This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast, a podcast with a worldwide listenership that explores the broad world of preservation from every angle, from drones to mudlarking and everything in between. Now, let's get preserving. One of preservation's biggest challenges is climate change. And on this week's PreserveCast, we're talking with Benjamin Curran, a 2021 recipient of the Harrison Goodall Fellowship. Curran's project looked at the viability of constructing low-cost, open-source sensors for the purpose of increasing the breadth of communities engaged in self-monitoring their susceptibility to sea level rise. Join us this week as we talk with Benjamin on how this project unfolded and what lessons it holds for preservationists across the nation. This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast. Today, we're excited to be talking to one of our own, Benjamin Curran, who currently works for Preservation Maryland and the program that it powers the Campaign for Historic Traits. But before he started his work with uh, the campaign, he was also a 2021 recipient of the Harrison Goodall Fellowship. And we've been talking to all of our previous Goodall Fellows, and we've been talking with them about their projects. And so we're going to be talking with Benjamin about his project, and what he was doing before he came to join our team. So, um, Benjamin, we like to get to know everybody that we're talking to. And for people who aren't familiar with you already, where did you grow up and when did you catch the uh, preservation bug? Um, well, uh, I would have to say I uh, grew up in New England. I've uh, moved quite a bit. My parents were uh, sort of hybrid beatnik hippies. And so... I moved 60 to 80 times thus far. Um, I've lost track. Um, but uh, the the place I, I would like to consider home is uh, New Hampshire. It's one of the places that uh, I spent the most time and some of the most formative time. Um, and uh, I worked my way through my undergraduate and graduate uh, studies, uh, in part doing carpentry and construction. And when you do carpentry in New England, uh, it is um, highly likely that you're working on a historic home. And so a lot of my experience uh, actually came from uh, doing damage to historic homes, uh, starting out doing renos and updates and all of that. Um, I, I'm sad to say that I actually uh, probably tore out a fair amount of historic uh, material uh, not recognizing what I was doing. Now I like to think that I'm doing I'm doing my penance uh, for such uh, work. But uh, in the process of tearing out historic uh, material, you get to see a lot of other historic material. Um, so over time, uh, I just became more mindful and conscientious of what I was doing, and um, I was I, I studied biochemistry and molecular biology, and I was going into pharmaceuticals, and I spent a year. Um, working for Stryker Biotech um, in their quality control lab and discovered that wasn't for me. And so I entered uh, a <clears throat> graduate program at Plymouth State. It's the only program uh, to ever exist. Sadly, it is closed down, but it, it was a hybrid uh, Masters of Historic Preservation, Masters of Education with a focus on historic preservation. And so I took all the conventional historic preservation classes, but I also had to complete all of the classes associated with the Master's of Education. Um, when I graduated, um, I was uh, trying to find jobs, and it's a relatively small industry. Um, and I had uh, I'd, I was constantly going back to school trying to get a better job than that which I was doing. I didn't want to swing a hammer. Um, I wanted a nine to five with a 401k. And so uh, when I finally finished all my schooling, I realized that, you know, the content the subject matter I knew best was actually carpentry and construction. Um, and so I tr decided to capitalize upon the, uh, my education background. Um, I'd taught before at the high school level. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to uh, get hired by Ed Edgecombe Community College, which had a um, two-year trades program. And so I was the lead instructor there for a number of years and then went on to uh, be the uh, head of the um, Historic Preservation Trades Program at Savannah Tech. So sort of a circuitous route. 
circuitous, but like many folks, um, there's there's sort of a, a common thread, and and obviously there's an interest in, in preservation. I think you may mm-hmm. um, take a preservation or preserve cast prize, I should say, for most moves ever referenced. I don't think we've ever heard 80 plus moves. We'll have to, we'd like to do a Google map of those at some point. Um, <clears throat> could be interesting. So um, you, before you came to work on the campaign for historic trades and you're doing curriculum development there, which is a perfect, um, you know, sort of overlap between all of your various passions and capabilities and, and interests um, between education and hands-on trades and we're working on developing these registered apprenticeships and you're the right person at the right time to help us get that done. Um, but before you came to us, um, you actually applied for a Harrison Goodall fellowship. So, um, you know, the Goodall fellowship is sort of this idea for supporting mid-career preservationists in kind of pursuing unique concepts and ideas funded, um, by the very generous Harrison Goodall uh, an amazing preservationist in his own right. Um, how'd you hear about the fellowship um, and what was uh, your project? So um, I heard about the fellowship. I, I got an email from someone uh, in telling me about it, um, but they, it was after the application date had closed for the first one. And so I kept it in mind for applying uh, for the second round, um, which was last year. Um, and I, I, I'm thrilled to have got it. It is, uh, uh, absolutely a marvelous, um, opportunity for, uh, new preservations, mid-career preservations, um, to sort of follow through with a project that is near and dear to their heart that might not otherwise, you know, be worthy, uh, or, um, merit a more formal grant. Um, those processes can be uh, rather onerous sometimes. And so having these micro uh, grants can be a real benefit to any industry. Um, and so <clears throat> what brought me to that point was uh, back in 2009, um, when I was uh, finishing up my graduate work, I was working in the geospatial lab at UNH. Um, and I was doing um, GIS mapping and satellite imagery and um, uh, finishing up my grad studies. And I did a project on Endicott period fortifications. Uh, there, Fort Stark is this, um, you know, concrete um, conglomeration of structures out on the tip of um, Newcastle on the coast of uh, New Hampshire. And <clears throat> I've been out there a number of times and I uh, recognized the deterioration. And it was a place that I'd gone when I was a kid. There's another uh, fortification, Ordeon, um, Fort Ordeon, which is across that small bay. And so, you know, I spent a lot of time there as a kid as well. Um, so I recognized the deterioration. And um, somehow there was this confluence of my interest in the deterioration of concrete. And um, there was some work going on in an adjacent uh, lab at UNH uh, that was very active in climate change. And so I started, you know, thinking about sea level rise and how it would impact that um, site. And so at the time, <clears throat> I did a, one of my uh, final papers. Um, I used um, low resolution um SRTM, shuttle-borne radar, topography, um, model imagery uh, to create uh, projected um, inundation maps of that sort of the um, sort of historic area of um, Portsmouth and Great Bay. And the resolution uh, of the uh, that imagery is like, I think it's 30 by 30 meters. So each pixel is like 90 feet by 90 feet. So it's super grainy, um, super blocky. Um, and so I did that. And then um, there was a fellow uh, working in um, Morris Hall, <clears throat> uh, Sam Meacham, uh, who is a research diver and uh, he had been studying uh, the cenotes, I think they're called, the sinkholes in the Yucatan Peninsula. 
And he was studying uh, the hydrology of the Yucatan and how water moves throughout the peninsula through these um, you know, cave systems. And it, what's really interesting about his work is that on one dive, I think he was like almost a, uh, like half a mile into this cave system underwater. So he dived down like 40 to 60 feet and then, you know, let's say um, – for hyperbole sake, uh, half a mile uh, into this underwater cave. And he came to another sink. And at the bottom of that, uh, if I recall correctly, there was the skeleton of a mammoth and a human and a projectile point like in the head of uh, this woolly mammoth. Um, so he found these prehistoric uh, remains. And um you know, I'm, I'm probably mixing up the facts a little bit with the movie that Nicolas Cage was in or something, but um, it was something to that effect. It, it really stuck out. <clears throat> so he had uh, received a, a grant um, at the time the National Geographic Society was partnering with the Waits Foundation, um, and they did, similar to the Harris, Harrison Goodall uh, Fellowship, small micro grants. And so he'd gotten one to help support um, his work there. And so a colleague of two colleagues of mine uh, at UNH applied and we got a small grant with intent of um, looking at um, the effects of sea level rise on um, the elevation of uh, groundwater uh, at Strawberry Bank. And so that was 2010. And what is Strawberry Bank for people listening? Strawberry Bank uh, Museum is this uh, absolutely wonderful um, conglomeration of uh, buildings in the historic district of uh, Portsmouth. I think they have 20 to 30 buildings. Um, the dates range from, I think, uh, Sherburn House is like 1690 something all the way up to the early 20th century. Um, and it, it, it's interpreted uh, wonderfully. It's just a great la cultural landscape. Uh, you can go through there and be walking through various uh, time periods. There's a, a section where they interpret um, one part of the campus to the um, Eastern European Jewish population that had um, lived there um, during the um, late 19th, early 20th century. And so there's always someone cooking in, I forget the name of the house, but um, there's always delicious smells and they have like a, a um, house garden there or kitchen garden that, you know, uh, pairs well with uh, Eastern European Jewish food that uh, they make. Um, so it's a wonderful campus, but um, part of the problem with the site is that there used to be this, um, tidal inlet, this small bay, uh, what was called Puddle Dock, um, that was a very active um, wharf community. <clears throat> and um, over time, actually not over time, like 1900, I think it was like 1900, that was it. They filled it in. Um, and they did so with, you know, what they had available, which was like, you know, dug out material from someplace else in cars, you know, um, I don't know whether they actually put cars in there, but you, you, they used whatever they had um, to fill it in. And um, so it's just filled with trash and, um, you know, filled from someplace else. So it's very uh, perme permeable. Um, the tide still pushes water through that um, um, uh, disturbed soil matrix, um, you know, on a daily basis. <clears throat> and that results in the water table in that area, you know, being uh, highly um, tied to the um, the tidal levels. So the basements regularly flood. And I talked to uh, Rodney Rowland uh, at one point, I think it was 2009, 2010. And he had mentioned, um, you know, this pressurized water uh, coming into the basements. And so, you know, I mentioned that to uh, uh, Gopal and Mike, um, Mike Roth here and Gopal Maktalak. Um, uh, Maktalak. Um, and <clears throat> so, uh, we decided to put together a little study and, uh, install the water level data loggers. Uh, we set up, uh, three stations comprised of two wells each. Um, and in each well or at each station, there was a, 
water level data logger inside the house and one outside the house <clears throat> so that we could see that, you know, the pressure that was being applied to the water table uh, via the elevation of uh, the sea level, just from tide, not necessarily sea level. Ones. Now, the, the, the loggers themselves, is this something that you designed or this was exact, you know, sort of, I don't want to say off the shelf, but this is something that exists. And this is... So you do this at Strawberry Bank, and how does this connect mm -hmm. back to the Goodall Fellowship? So it was through the loggers. We had to buy them. Um, and water level data loggers, so the sensors and the loggers, uh, can be upwards of, you know, package $2,000. Um, and so um, it, it's very cost prohibitive to set up one of these uh, sensor arrays. And so coming out of that project, um, I had wanted to <clears throat> develop a water level data logger that was um, DIY because this was sort of when um, Arduino and um, DIY micro uh, controllers um, were becoming readily available. And so <clears throat> one of the issues we had was we had to regularly take the um, sensors out in order to uh, download the data. And so I had wanted to um, create a system that utilized um, uh, Bluetooth, um, the Bluetooth capacity of cell phones. <clears throat> so um, I didn't have the means uh, to follow through with this until I got the Harrison Goodall. Um, you know, as I was noting earlier, for small projects like this, it's a real challenge uh, to find funders uh, that... Uh, recognize the merit of um, small projects. You know, not every uh, innovation requires a hundred thousand or a million dollars. Um, there are a lot of things that can be, you know, done with these uh, very small um, uh, grants. And so, you know, that's what the Harrison Fellowship um, allowed me to do was um, to look into developing. Um, and building a water dev water level data logger. Um, the sensor itself, <laughs> you can't really um, build yourself. Uh, pressure transducers are a little bit outside of uh, the realm of my ability and my little desk in my bedroom. Um, but I was able to um, buy all the components uh, for the uh, water level data logger. Um, through Adafruit um, is a great company. Um, it, <clears throat> the microcontrollers processors are equivalent to, you know, Arduino, um, but they have all sorts of, you know, shields and components. So I was able to assemble um, a device that was um, cell phone enabled that, um, you know, had a, a battery um, pack that could be um, charged. I even looked into trying to uh, use the, um, oh, what are they um, called? You know, those little pads that you put your uh, cell phone on. Um, oh, like a charging pad. Yeah, there's a term for that um, uh, device, but I've looked into sort of trying to remotely charge. Um, but so within that process, I had to solder together everything and uh, one of the um, most notable byproducts of the the whole endeavor was that um, I need uh, bifocals um, I can't solder worth a, a darn um, I had I ended up having to use two magnifying glasses in order to uh, do the work um, and I presume that with my mechanical aptitudes, it would be uh, super easy. And I was very wrong. Um, so putting it all together was a, a, a real challenge. Um, and then the, there was the the program. Yeah, I was going to say, so you put it together, you've got the, the and then the, the computer program that kind of runs the whole thing. What has been the application of it? Where can or will or could this go? Well, so um, the the byproduct of building the device was that um, it it isn't practical for um, 
a small scale project. What I was um, proposing is that um, I want to create sort of a curriculum or a protocol by which other people could build these water level data loggers and set up their own arrays. Um, you know, and the um, founding principle or um, concept behind that is that well, we just don't have uh, the time, resources, or people uh, with which to get all the data we need in order to appreciate the breadth of impacts of climate change. Um, and so if some of that can be <clears throat> um, put out there to citizen science or, uh, scientists and paraprofessionals, if there can be, you know, um, solidly developed protocols and curriculum put in place so that, you know, high school school students could be, um, you know, building these devices, then that data could then be uh, utilized um, by um, scientists to better appreciate, you know, localized impacts. So uh, coming out of that, uh, <clears throat> it is uh, impractical um, to do um, the whole construction. Um, it requires a level of familiarity, uh, mechanical aptitude uh, that a lot of people aren't going to be able to develop right on the spot. With that said, I did find a great system. Um, it's the Enviro DIY um, Mayfly is the name of the um, system. And so it requires a fair amount of assembly. Um, the bulk of the electronics have, you know, been put together. You still have to add like the uh, cell phone shield and the uh, SD card um, component. So there's still a bit, a bit of assembly, which makes it engaging and interesting. Um, but uh, there isn't enough to um, hinder people from, you know, being able to do it because they need bifocals. Um, so if and so that are... device... Well, I was going to say, if people are interested in in that component and people want to maybe pick up the research that you've done and kind of take it to the next step, where will that be available and where could this now, now end up being deployed or has it been deployed or will it be deployed? It hasn't. So um, I <clears throat> this coming season, I'll be deploying it in my pool. Um, and <clears throat> I call it a pool. Um, sometimes I um, think of it as a future koi pond. Um, but the water levels um, fluctuate a fair amount in it. And so I plan on testing it there. Uh, the device is, um, uh, has a cell, uh, solar panel, and so um, it is self-charging. And then it comes with a um, cellular card. And so all the um, information is uploaded via cell phone. Uh, so it's a great little system. Um, <clears throat> I, um, have the, uh, water level sensor. And so that will go in my pool and then, um, all of that will be, um, put online. Um, uh, I'm, uh, pretty sure the, that my PowerPoint will be, um, put up on, um, one of our web pages shortly with all the other Harrison Goodall, um, presentations, um, and we can put that link in here into the show notes. If people are interested in like figuring out how they can track water levels or sea level rise at their historic site, is this a potential model for that? I mean, they sort of the citizen science component to this? Sure. <clears throat> I think so. Um, I think there needs to be a, a little bit more work on the back end, um, i.e., where does the information go? Um, you know, it's great to have a sensor. It's great to collect the data. But if you don't have some place to send it and people to interpret it, then, you know, it, uh, there's not a lot of point to it. And so that was the next that's sort of the next step is um, uh, developing some sort of uh, network by which people can um, share that data, have it go to a central point and then have professionals, um, you know, actually interpreting the data. And so what's next for the project? Is that doing that? Is it, you know, what are you working on with this now? And where could this potentially head? 
Well, <clears throat> um, Strawberry Bank has uh, taken uh, our work and uh, gone to the next level with it. They're really doing some amazing work with their resiliency um, um, projects. And um, so <clears throat> they are. They continue to work with uh, Mike Roth here at UNH and have set up a system by which uh, the loggers there uh, send the information to UNH. UNH has um, the data is collected there, uh, kept there, housed there. <laughs> it is um, represented via a uh, interactive website, and then uh, there is a kiosk, a touchscreen kiosk at Strawberry Bank, which allows uh, visitors to interact with that. Uh, information as well so that they can appreciate the uh, potential impacts of sea level rise on um, that landscape. So ultimately, the um, hope is to, or intent is to um, expand that network. So uh, capitalize upon the experience of put together the system at Strawberry Bank and then you know, do the Atlantic Seaboard and the, and beyond. Yeah, it's the beginning of something. And I know that you're hoping to kind of work on that through the auspices of Preservation Maryland and see if we can't um, connect a network of folks together. So that's kind of the big story here, which is the research kind of put together the pieces um, and your passion kind of brought you here. And now it's where can this go? Um, where can we take this model um, and kind of work out the kinks, create the back end um, and figure out a way of documenting what's happening to historic sites because you say and i think maybe one of the takeaways here too is we really don't have very good data on the impact of this particularly on historic sites is that true like there's just not it's not out there yeah <clears throat> and you know there it isn't to say there isn't a lot of data out there it's just sort of second hand and th that's how i characterize it you know there are all sorts of um there are wells and water level monitoring systems out there. Um, but they're focused more on um, providing information for infrastructure, for large municipalities, for cities, uh, what have you. Um, but as you know, um, site specificity is so important. Recognizing uh, the impacts of um, you know, the elevation of uh, the groundwater level or intrusion of sea level rise, that's going to have very, very specific effects on historic material. Uh, and if we're not um, able to collect that data, then we're sort of simply relying upon the information of others to sort of um, um, suppose what will happen. Um, and so, you know, uh, the other thing is that <clears throat> um, we have the means to do this. Um, there are a lot of uh, communities, uh, localities, countries out there that don't. And so one of my hopes and actually the uh, sort of the, uh, I think the catalyst for me was the concept of creating something here where we have the means such that other people can copy us later on that don't have the ability to, you know, develop a system like this, you know, uh, Bangladesh, you know, is, uh, or the Maldives or uh, wherever, um, you know, that they don't have the, uh, as much resources as we do to put towards uh, this type of study. So if we can do it, then, you know, it, it certainly benefits us, but uh, there are a lot of other people that um, I think would uh, benefit far more because um, we'll, we will always have more resources than so many people. And uh, so I, I, I like the idea of utilizing those resources in a way that benefits us, but also enriches, you know, uh, the welfare of others um, as much as we can. Well, it's perhaps a good place to leave it. And people can find out more about this. We'll put a link in the show notes to the research and how this all comes together. And if people are interested in getting in touch with you about perhaps, you know, being a demonstration site for the expansion of this project, they can do that. Um, this has real applications, particularly for people um, maintaining and managing historic sites that are um, vulnerable to sea level rise and other impacts of climate change. Um, before we go, we ask everybody this. Um, well, we know what you're working on now, which is expanding this and uh, also developing developing uh, open source curriculum for the future of historic trades training. So you do have your hands uh, full in terms of what you're working on now. But um, I'm curious, uh, 
having moved 80 times and loving historic places, do you have uh, one place that you consider your favorite historic site? Well, um, uh, I really enjoyed visiting um, the house that my uh, great grandparents lived in in Montana. Uh, you know, that was certainly uh, historic for me. They were sheep farmers um, and lived out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and it was a beautiful landscape. And, you know, uh, it was 120 years old. So it's uh, historic um, and meaningful. And I think uh, the thing that I found most interesting about it uh, was that uh, we have a picture of it being moved uh, to its current location being pulled by, uh, I think it was four set of oxen. So they lifted it up and put a bunch of uh, carts, uh, wagons underneath it, and then attached uh, four uh, pairs of oxen. And uh, they took the picture of looking down from a, um, a valley up at it. And so, you know, it's up on this ridge. Well, that's, um, that's so, one, way to, one way to get it done in Montana style, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's an awesome place to leave it. It's good talking with you. Um, people can find out more about your project by clicking the show notes or by getting in touch with you, um, and all your contact information will be available, or they can jump on any of the Preservation Maryland sites and find you there. Thanks so much, Benjamin. Thank you. I had a great time. Thanks for listening to PreserveCast. To dig deeper into this episode's story, head over to PreserveCast.org for show notes and our collection of previous episodes. Don't forget to engage with this podcast by subscribing, commenting, and leaving a review. Follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at PreserveCast for even more. PreserveCast is currently recorded in Walkersville, Maryland, and sponsored by the 1772 Foundation and powered by Preservation Maryland. Thanks for listening, and keep on preserving.